On Tech News Today, we've got some awesome journalists on the show from Fusion, Newsweek, Forbes, Search Engine Land, and BuzzFeed News. So stick around. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, July 16th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Braintree. If you're working on a mobile app and searching for a simple payment solution, check out Braintree. With one simple integration, you can offer your customers every way to pay. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash TNT. And by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and get a $50 Visa gift card when you get a loan. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin. Welcome to the show. Our co-anchor today is Fusion Editor Kashmir Hill. How you doing, Kashmir? I am great. Hey, Kashmir, can you keep it down? You know, <laughs> you mentioned on Twitter, I think it was Twitter, that you think everybody ought to turn off all their sound on their phone all the time. Why is that? It, the phone sounds bother you? So I wrote a whole story about this. I was channeling my inner Andy Rooney. I don't want people's phones to make any noise in public. I don't want to hear them ring. I don't want to hear them beep. I don't want to hear them playing games. I think it is barbaric in this day and age to have your phone making noise in public. It should always be on silent. It should just softly buzz against your body. But uh, isn't that kind of like... Uh a recipe for missing calls, missing texts, missing out on all the things that are happening that aren't, are not involving the conversation you happen to be having or whatever? No, I disagree because everybody has their phone either touching their body or sitting on the table in a way where it lights up when something important is happening. Um, I, I just don't think we need sound anymore. And I think we still have it because, Sorry. yeah, <laughs> exactly. It interrupts <laughs> conversations, trains of thought. My favorite thing about the Apple Watch is the, the haptic feedback where it just buzzes against your body in a way that no one else hears. And I think that all technology should be like that. It should be non-disruptive. Everybody in uh, the chat room is saying, I love cashmere. I don't know what's happening, but your whole fan club has apparently shown up. Uh, yeah, you know, it's... I thought I would get some pushback. I thought people would get angry about this, but everybody just agreed with me. I have yeah. not seen anybody write or say that this is a bad idea. Well, speaking of haptic feedback, uh, one of the things I've discovered is that the, the vibration on the Apple Watch happens a little bit less than a second before the noise hits. And we have, like, I have a mute pedal. Like, I can hit a mute pedal, and on the big desk over there when I'm doing twig or twit, uh, there's a there's a big button. And I found that there's, I have enough time to hit the mute so that nobody can hear on the show, can hear my watch making noise. Uh, so that's actually helpful if you want to, you know, muzzle the sound by covering it or whatever. You, you have, like... Less than almost a almost a second. Well, why don't we jump into the story uh, into the first story because we have lots of news today and lots and lots of interview guests. Uh, so our first story is about law and order. The FBI and more than a dozen international law enforcement organizations shut down a site called Dark Code, which is like an Amazon.com for hacker products, including malware, botnets, and even credit card information stolen during exploits. Lauren Walker is a reporter for Newsweek and joins us now to talk about this story. Welcome to the show, Lauren. Thanks for having me. So glad you're here. Now, there are hundreds of such sites online. There's uh, nothing unique about Dark Code that I'm aware of. Why did the FBI focus on Dark Code and launch such a big crackdown on this? They are claiming that it was one of the biggest threats amongst the hundreds that are out there. I think they estimate there are 800. Wow. What kind of things were they uh, selling on Dark Code, Lauren? Malware, botnets, personal stolen information, like credit card information, stuff like that. Now, I love, I love these uh, procedural dramas <laughs> that are always associated with uh, stories like this. How many, uh, how did they manage to do the takedown and how long did it take? Like, can you give us a little bit of details about what was involved in an international effort like this to bring down a shady site like Darkode? 
Sure. So the FBI led the effort, and it was about two years ago that they got a tip and tried to infiltrate. And then they sat there for 18 months collecting information from some of the most egregious cyber criminals. I think it's so interesting the way that the FBI's job has changed, that going undercover now is just a matter of coming up with a good handle online. Um, You know, we've seen this a couple of times now. Do you see this takedown as being as big as the Silk Road takedown? No, I I think that the Silk Road takedown was definitely bigger, but I think we're going to see many more of these, especially since they only arrested a portion of the people who are using the site, and they've now moved on to more secure forums. How many, so this is one of many. How many people did they arrest, and where were these uh, uh, perp, alleged perps uh, located? Were they all over the world? Yes, they were all over the world, and they searched, arrested, charged around 70 people so far. Arrests are ongoing, and I believe 12 were indicted in the U.S. so far. Wasn't, I, I, I think I read on Forbes that one of the people who was indicted in the U.S. was actually working for an anti-malware firm. Do you know anything about that? I do not, but I believe that. <laughs> yeah, I believe it was FireEye, and I think it was an intern or like a pretty low-level staffer, but it sure made them uh, look awfully bad. Uh, and uh, one one last uh, question for you, Lauren. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things about this is that they infiltrated, infiltrated this site and dark code, a site like dark code, isn't something like Twitter where you can just go and the public can just go and sign up and start using it. Uh, you right. have to kind of be uh, allowed into the secret kingdom there. Uh, what did we learn about how dark code users gained access to the site? Sure. So it was invitation only, which means you had to be referred by someone who was already a member. And then you had to post a resume of sorts on the site. Uh, which was all password protected, and your resume would contain things like um, your skills, your past crimes, what you have to contribute to the forum, and then there would be a decision made about whether you could join or not. Wow, to see if your crimes were heinous enough to actually gain membership. Wow, that's really, really interesting. Lauren Walker's at Newsweek.com and on Twitter at Laser Lauren. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lauren. Thanks for having me. All right. Got some more news for you coming right up. But first, let's talk about Braintree. You know, Alex just mentioned that uh, one of the big deals about buying things with a mobile device is the whole enter your credit card payments process. And that's what Braintree fixes. If you have a mobile app, if you're a developer, or if you have a, a, a website and you want to take payments, Braintree is a great solution. It's the great solution. Uh, it's a full stack payments platform that makes it really easy to accept payments in your app or on your website. You can accept People who have MasterCard, American Express, Discover, Diners Club, PayPal, Apple Pay, Venmo, Visa, you name it, even Bitcoin. You can take Bitcoin for your product. If you're a mobile app developer, you want to check out Braintree. Uh, they're used by companies like Uber, Airbnb, and Munchery. Braintree offers a JavaScript library for uh, mobile and desktop web and plus you know, it supports uh, uh, iOS, Android, and Windows Phone with uh, some really great SDKs. You want to check out Braintree simply because it's easy for everyone. It's easy for you, and that's really important. But even more important is that it's easy for your customers. You don't want people uh, leaving halfway through a transaction because it's too hard to do. You want it to be easy so they go straight through to the end. They get what they want, and you get what you want, which is a new customer. Braintree gives you a full stack payment solution, support for all payment types that your customers might want. You can start accepting PayPal, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, Venmo, credit cards, so much more, all with a single integration across all platforms and all with superior fraud protection, customer service, and fast payouts. To learn more and for your first $50,000 in transactions fee-free, go to braintreepayments.com slash TNT. That's braintreepayments.com slash TNT. Singer and songwriter Neil Young announced yesterday that he's pulling all his music from streaming music services because the sound quality sucks. Here's what Neil Young told Leo on a recent episode of Triangulation. Uh, I think they have more music around them than ever before because they, they can't get away from it. It's like going to Las Vegas. It's like, it's, the it's like here we are. We've got wallpaper. Everywhere yeah, you are, it wallpaper. Is. Everywhere you yeah. go, music is playing. Yeah. And if you listen to it, most of it doesn't sound that good. Technically, it doesn't sound that good. And you really aren't distracted by it because it's background. 
You're not grabbing. You're not by hearing. It. You're not hearing the real thing. Yeah. It's a simulation. It's like a Xerox of the Mona Lisa. It's it, it, it's just not there. That's a good line. So Xerox really of the Mona Lisa. Uh, Zach Schoenfeld is a reporter for also Newsweek, and he joins us now to talk about this story. Welcome to you, Zach. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on. Neil Young is behind the Pono player, which boasts higher quality audio than regular MP3s. Is this all just a big publicity stunt to sell Pono players? Oh, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think that's the case. I think that Neil Young genuinely believes that um, digital music formats are an outrage. I mean, for a very long time, he's been a champion of, of analog and vinyl and um, higher sound quality. Um, I, I wouldn't say that this is a publicity stunt, but at the same time, you know, it, it doesn't hurt, does it? Uh, Jay-Z launched Tidal this year, and one of the promises was that it was going to have this higher quality um, sound. Why, why do you think Neil Young isn't just moving some of his music over there? Um, I'm not sure if Tidal is is up to Neil Young's standards in, in terms of high sound quality. Um, but I mean, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I, I wonder if Neil Young has looked, has looked into Tidal. I'm not quite sure. I mean, I love the idea of super high quality sound in theory, but can the public really tell the difference between streaming music and the, the quality of, this, of the music that they would get on a Pono player? The vast majority of people cannot. Um, you, you have to be pretty deep into, you know, audiophile. Um, you, you have to be pretty deep into it to be able to hear the difference. I don't, I don't doubt that Neil Young can tell, but most people, you know, I mean, people listened to cassettes for years in, in the 80s and early 90s, and cassettes sound absolutely awful. Um, but, you know, people were buying them because that's what's convenient. And in 2015, streaming music is, is what's convenient. It's, it's what's easy, it's what's cheap, and it's what most people have access to. We've seen artists pulling their music from platforms for lots of different reasons, you know, sound quality or for business reasons in terms of Oh, how big a cut they're getting. What kind of effect is this having on the artist and the distribution of their music? Are, you know, does this work or are they essentially losing audience because they're doing this? Um, sure, they're, sure, they're losing audience. I mean, you, I can't stream Prince on Spotify anymore because he just, really, he just removed his music from Spotify um, a, a few weeks ago. But the, it, what I find interesting is that most of the artists who are taking stands against music streaming platforms are really big, powerful, rich artists who can afford to, to, to make that kind of sacrifice. It, it, I mean, most of the artists who've done this have been making a, a statement about artist compensation models. And it, it's not the kind of artists who really need that money. It's artists like Taylor Swift, who, who is extremely successful, extremely wealthy. Um, and I, I think she sees herself as taking a stand for the smaller and less prominent artists who, who can't afford to, to take that kind of drastic action. Zach, I have a personal question for you. Your Twitter handle looks like a cat was walking across your keyboard. You have four Zs, four As, four Cs, and three Hs. Why only three Hs? Why not four Hs? Uh, there, there's a limit on how long a Twitter handle can be, and that <laughs> limit is actually 15 characters. So my Twitter handle uh, takes it to the limit. All right, taking it to the limit. Zach Schoenfeld is, is at Newsweek.com and on Twitter at 4Zs, 4As, 4Cs, and 3Hs. Thank you so much for joining us today, Zach. Thank you for having me. All right. Amazon held their annual Amazon Prime Day promotion yesterday, a kind of early Black Friday designed to reward Prime members and incentivize non-members to sign up. It sounds like a great idea, but things didn't go so well yesterday. Claire O'Connor is a staff writer for Forbes and joins us to talk about it. Welcome to you, Claire. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being on. Now, Adobe actually measures shopper sentiment on social media for Amazon Prime Day. What did they learn when they did their measurements? Well, yeah, so Adobe actually measures 4 million plus impressions all across social media, and they use a kind of amusing language in their findings. They found that 50% of uh, social media mentions for Prime Day were related to sadness, the words they used. <laughs> um, and only 23% were related to joy. So more people complaining than, you know, claiming they got a good sale is what Adobe's saying. Uh, Claire, it's so good to see you. It's been a while since we've been together yeah. before. Um, nice to see you really too. Nice. I, I was surprised and delighted to see you with us today. Um, so what is Amazon Prime Day? Why does Amazon do this? How long have they been doing it? Well, uh, it's, it was actually, it's the first time around and it's to celebrate Amazon's 20th birthday, if you can actually believe it. Uh, doesn't seem wow. it's been around that long. 
Um, it's really just intended from, you know, the experts I spoke to actually think this is just Amazon kind of flexing their muscles and saying, you know, we're a massive retail force. Why should shoppers have to wait till Black Friday? We're just going to throw this day out there in the middle of the summer and see if it sticks. Um, and I'm just not sure that, you know, the feedback that I've been seeing shows that it has, you know, stuck. I don't know if we're going to see it every year. Well, let's talk about why there was so much sadness around around Amazon Prime Day. Uh, E-commerce firm Clavis Insight tracked the availability of some Prime Day items. What did they learn about the availability of these products? Well, you know, I think people uh, traditionally run to these kind of doorbuster Black Friday type sales for electronics. Those are the big things that go first. And Amazon, you think electronics, you think Kindles, you think their new Fire Stick. And those sold out, you know, pretty early on. Uh, this company, Clavis Insight, found that by lunchtime Eastern, 91% of Kindles were sold out. The Fire Stick was gone. There was a wait list for a lot of these electronic items that are popular, and a lot of the wait lists were full. So I think customers were a little bit annoyed uh, that you know they had to get up really, really early if they were going to get a good deal. So Claire, you're the expert on retail and e-commerce. What do you think other companies are going <laughs> to learn from Amazon's Prime Day experience? Well, you know, I think it's interesting that. Um, in these days in e-commerce, Amazon really jumps and other people say how high. Um, Walmart put out a fairly snarky statement and blog post a couple days before saying, we've heard a certain retailer that charges $99 a year is having a big sale. I think they're learning that, you know, Amazon's obviously no slouch, especially when it comes to free shipping. Walmart was forced to lower its prices on shipping for this week. They put it down from $50 to $35 to get your shipping free. And I think we're going to see more of that. I think really... Uh, the contest online now is what can you give the shopper that, you know, Amazon is not offering. All right. Well, Claire O'Connor is at Forbes.com, and you can follow her on Twitter at Claire underscore OC. Claire, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Nice to see you, Cashmere. Great to see you, Claire. Companies hire search engine optimization managers all the time. It's really no big deal. They do it mainly to improve their search engine rankings on Google. But now even Google is hiring an SEO manager. Barry Schwartz is the publisher of Search Engine Roundtable and wrote about this for Search Engine Land. Welcome to you, Barry Schwartz. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. How do we know Google is hiring an SEO manager? It's pretty simple. It's on their career site. You can just um, go to their job site and just do a search for search engine optimization. And Google is, as of yesterday, hiring an SEO Barry, this seems kind of crazy. Why does Google need an SEO manager? Can't they just, you know, put their own results at the top of Google search? So you guys covered this before, obviously, regarding the, um, you know, speculation and the claims by some governments as well as some uh, groups out there basically saying that Google does what they want with their search results. They manipulate them and they actually artificially inflate their own search service, their own services to be higher in the search results. So this specific job was from the uh, Google Cloud platform, and they're trying to, I guess, compete more with like Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Services, as well as you know uh, Rackspace, cloud computing, and stuff like that, and try to get, I guess, more visibility in the search results. Technically and legally, they're not. I mean, maybe probably technically and ethically, they're probably not supposed to go ahead and say, you know, you do a search for cloud computing or cloud, you know, servers. They're not going to go ahead and just rank their website higher, um, although. Um, they probably can, um, but I don't think they are ethically allowed to, um, or that will probably get them into a lot of legal problems. So it's interesting that Google actually went ahead and hired an SEO because they have lots of platforms. They sell lots of services um, across lots of different you know, verticals. The question is why are they just hiring an SEO for the first time with this division and not why haven't they done it in the past? Did the ad specify that they are going to be optimizing for Google search? Or is it possible that they're going to optimize for everything or specifically for Bing or other search engines? It didn't specifically say Google search. It just said drive organic traffic. Um, but as you know, um, especially uh, with people searching for cloud platforms and stuff, these people are more likely to use Google. So I would say 90% plus of the, of the queries related to this type of service would probably be done over Google. So it's pretty safe to say that they're probably optimizing for Google. Um, and again, the interesting thing is you only need two years of SEO experience. Um, <laughs> it, does, it really doesn't talk anything about like off-page factors. Um, and, but it's not that uncommon. You have companies like Yahoo and Yahoo has searched. They had a whole SEO department 
uh, focused on you know driving traffic through searched or tra organic traffic to their websites. I believe Microsoft has a whole huge SEO department as well, and they obviously run Bing search. Um, it's just that why does Google need it? Why is why is this the first time? It's just a fairly interesting thing, and of course the SEO community is having a, a major um, fun time with this because you know who and usually the, the SEO community and Google don't see eye to eye, and to see hi Google hire an SEO is just one of those fun things. Yeah, and one of their own inside the tent uh, should be interesting. Barry Schwartz is at seoroundtable.com, rustybrick.com, and also on Twitter at rustybrick. Thanks for joining us today, Barry. Thank you. Facebook wants to become a store, a place where you go to buy all kinds of stuff. Alex Kantrowitz is a senior technology reporter for BuzzFeed News who writes about social media. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks for having me, Mike. All right. Now, you reported Facebook is creating shops within Facebook pages. What's that going to look like? Can look really sleek. I was able to see a preview of them, and basically, I sort of think of them as the instant articles for uh, commerce on Facebook. So instant articles, you tap a news story, and they immediately show up. And with these shops, you tap into the shop, and you can browse products, and then in some cases, actually check out on Facebook itself. Alex, do you think Facebook users are going to want to buy products on Facebook? I do. Um, I think that we saw. The way that we consume news change, it went from a sort of pull to a push, which is we used to visit or subscribe to newspapers or visit websites, and now that content comes to us. And I think there's a good chance that on, from a commerce standpoint, um, that will happen uh, on Facebook as well. Now, we heard earlier in the week that Facebook is creating a virtual assistant inside Messenger. It's not really a virtual assistant. It's really a, a access to human assistance and you specify that these will actually help people buy products specifically so first of all is that all these assistants are going to do help you buy stuff and second of all do we know who these people are are they volunteers are they employees uh, any information uh, that you can give us about this uh, virtual uh, assistant feature in messenger would be really awesome i think it's still early days to um really comment on that and uh, I don't. I haven't spoken with Facebook about it, and uh, I could speculate, but um, I think that I'd uh, rather just leave it until more information comes out on that part of what Facebook's doing. Do you think that this is going to appeal to the stores in terms of like what they're able to know about people on Facebook and what they like? Is this going to be like a more successful commerce channel for them? Um, does Facebook have that kind of information about people? I don't know if um, it will be more successful, but I think that stores are going to be forced to use these shops. They're looking at uh, internet where people used to visit an unlimited number of sites on the desktop web. And now in mobile, we spend almost all of our time in apps and 80% of our time in apps are spent with the top five apps. So where does that leave a shop? Basically makes them compelled to set up a shop in different apps, the ones that are uh, used more often. There's, there's like, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Alex. There seems to be a crazy gold rush to um, put buy buttons on everything. Pinterest does it. Facebook wants to do it. Google wants to do it. People want to do it in advertising. Uh, there's just going to be so many different ways to click to buy on online. Uh, right now, I think when people want to buy something, they go to Google search or some other search engine. They search for the product and they get a listing. Uh, sometimes the top listing is Amazon or some other retailer. What's it going to be like to buy stuff in two or three years when everything and everyone has a buy button? I think you have to think about the motivation behind putting a buy button on these sites. Uh, all these companies have pretty high valuations, and they're almost all going after the digital advertising industry, $60 billion pie. Facebook is valued at $250-something billion. So how does that make sense? They'd have to have the entire digital advertising pie and then some in order to justify that valuation. So I think that you're going to see these companies put a ton of emphasis on driving commerce and sales within their platforms because that's a $350 billion market and something that actually can justify the value of these companies on Wall Street. Alex, do you know how this is going to work? If somebody buys something on Facebook, would they be sending their credit card information along to the store that they're buying from? Or is Facebook, this is another way that Facebook is now going to hold our credit card numbers because they're acting as uh, the pass along here. 
I mean, I don't know for sure, um, but I do believe that Facebook is going to be, um, I mean, it, wouldn't, it would only make sense for Facebook to do this. Here's the thing. On mobile, the most annoying thing about uh, buying things is having to enter your credit card information on the tiny little screen. Um, and in fact, we've seen the research that uh, most people research products on mobile and then buy them on desktop. So the social networks um, like Facebook and Pinterest and Twitter that have these buy buttons, uh, it only makes sense for them to store the information on the credit cards. Uh, they store the credit card information to enable you to just hit buy once and then get out of there. That's going to remove a lot of the friction within uh, the mobile purchase uh, activity right now. So this is the launch of Facebook Wallet. Yeah, I mean, they're already enabling money transfers in and Messenger. And I don't think they did that because they think that the business of Venmo is uh, an incredibly large business that they want to take down. I think it's really to get people comfortable with entering their credit card information on Facebook. And then, um, you know, the possibilities are endless once they have that. All right. Well, Alex Kantrowitz writes all kinds of really interesting articles at BuzzFeed.com. And you can follow him on Twitter. And you should follow him at Kantrowitz with a K. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Mike. All right. Well, we've advertised Blue Apron in the past. And by the way, this is not an ad. This is actually a follow-up for those of you who are using Blue Apron. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that Blue Apron now has an app you might want to know about. Uh, the Blue Apron app has video tutorials and other how-to information, including suggested cooking tools. It's the same information that you'd find on their website, but you get it in the app so it's more convenient in the kitchen. Uh, it even has a built-in timer and a way to take pictures of your food and share them so you can stay within the app the whole time you're making Blue Apron meals. The food picture-taking feature even has special effects, including one that'll add animated steam to your photos. I don't know if that will look good or not, but uh, uh, they do have it and some others as well. You can also rate recipes so you can you know, see which are the great recipes, which ones are less great. And the iOS version of the app is now available. The Android version is coming soon, according to the company. Well, in mergers and acquisitions news, Facebook's Oculus unit said today that it intends to buy Israeli gesture recognition technology firm Pebbles Interfaces. Terms were not disclosed in Kashmir Hill. Boy, Israel is really, you know, it seems like their main product is companies to be sold to Silicon Valley companies. It's really incredible. Every day we have another story about an acquisition of an Israeli company. It is. And I haven't seen somebody go do a great profile of the, you know, the Israeli Silicon Valley. Um, I would love to see that because they, they really are doing some incredible, uh, incredible startups there. They are. And they're developing a lot of uh, original technology. That technology is in almost all these acquisitions being purchased as part of a joint technology buy and an aqua hire. They, they tend to keep the engineers on and they set up a new uh, sort of division in uh, Tel Aviv or wherever and uh, keep it going. But it's, it's really amazing how many companies are being acquired. I guess uh, this year there have probably been hundreds just since the beginning of the year. Well, in the Human Resources Department, Peter Rojas, who is the co-founder of Gizmodo, Engadget, Joystick, and GDGT, is now leaving AOL for the New York-based seed stage venture capital firm Betaworks. And Peter is a really, really nice guy. Got the chance to interview him for Triangulation uh, a few months ago. Well, we got uh, a really, uh, some really interesting news you can lose. But first, let's talk about Prosper. Prosper is the way to borrow money. You don't want to go to a bank. You don't want to borrow from your cousin. <laughs> there are lots of bad ways to borrow money and one really, really good way, which is Prosper.com. You can borrow up to $35,000 in as few as five days. And you can use the money for just about anything you want. You can get a debt consolidation loan, a home improvement loan, an auto or vehicle loan, a small business loan, even a special occasion loan. Go to Prosper.com and check out the different types of loans. You can even see all the loans that are that are out there being funded. Uh, and uh, it's just a, a great way. You know, a lot of these loans that people are, are getting are for debt consolidation. It's just a perfect thing to do to, to to borrow money at a low interest rate and then pay off high interest credit cards. It's just money in your pocket if you do that. Uh, they have uh, facilitated over $4 billion in loans to 250,000 people who have borrowed money through Prosper. It's really an amazing company. Now and for a limited time, Prosper is offering Twit viewers and listeners a $50 Visa gift card 
with your low interest loan. You can get up to a $35,000 in your account in as few as five days and a $50 Visa gift card. So go to prosper.com slash twit with a special offer, which is just for twit fans. In news you can lose, do you find social interaction awkward? Well, now there's an app for that. It's called Blush No More, and it gives you crib notes on what to talk about during dinner parties and dates. To use it, you just tell the app what kind of location or situation you're in, whether you're at work or at a bar or at a wedding. And then the app gives you conversation starting questions to ask, which are actually based on interviews uh, done by professional journalists like Kashmir Hill. It even has an interactive guide to body language, so you know if you're hitting it off with the other person. Kashmir Hill, is there anything more awkward than having a conversation with somebody and getting your questions from an app? Yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit awkward if you're like looking, you know, glancing at your phone, trying to decide what to say to somebody. This really reminds me actually of um, people that work though with um, people with autism in terms of figuring out how to have social interactions and what to ask and how to interpret what people are doing. Um, and it's, it's strange to think that we would all need this um, and I would just say I did not come up with any questions for this app. <laughs> okay, good. I was looking for the Cashmere Hill questions in there. I didn't find any. Uh, they, were all, they were all softballs. That's why. All right. Well, our TNT fan of the day is Mobile Doc, who posted this video on YouTube and Twitter. He watches Tech News Today at 1.5 speed to save time. So there's Cashmere Hill talking really fast. <laughs> Um, so it'll be, it'll be an interesting case. Um, Those dangling earrings are kind of yeah. <laughs> going all over the place. That's right. I actually listened to, to my podcast at 1.5 speed, and I find it just great. It's like it's it's actually kind of more engaging. And I listen to this show at 1.5 uh, speed, and I sound smarter when I talk faster. So uh, anyway. You're faster than the rest of us all the time, Mike. <laughs> well, I try. Drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT or HowFastIWatchTNT, and we can find it. Uh, thank you so much for sending those uh, and posting those on social media. We really love to see those, even if we don't get a chance to plug or show all of them. Uh, Kashmir Hill, what interesting and fascinating thing are you working on besides giving people like me a hard time about having the noise on our phones. Besides glaring at people making noise with their <laughs> phones, I, like many people on the internet, uh, am riveted by the Civil War at Reddit. Um, wow. And I am looking forward to seeing what the new CEO has to say today during the, this Ask Me Anything announcement. Do you have any predictions about what he's going to announce? Well, Matthew Ingram of Fortune was tweeting that Reddit is going to launch some kind of uh, news that's not safe for humanity section uh, where they would tag the really nasty stuff on Reddit and it would only be available to Reddit users who are logged in and it would be you know, carefully gated as the, the ugly, harassing side of Reddit. And you would have to prove that you were 18 by clicking a box that says I'm 18, something like that. Or, 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 prove, or click a box that says like, I am inhumane. Yeah, I, th that sounds like something Reddit would do just, just for the heck of it. Kashmir Hill, thank you so much. Can't wait to read your uh, report on the drama at Reddit, and I will see you next week. See you next week, Mike. All right, bye-bye. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on your favorite podcast app, or you can choose another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. That page will also give you all kinds of information about each and every show that we do. If you're ever near Petaluma, California, you should come in and watch us as part of our live studio audience. You can send email to tickets at twit.tv before you come in to buy those tickets. You get them free. We don't sell them. Uh, you can subscribe to our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com. You don't need to click on anything to see that. You just go straight there. Uh, we are very humane. Uh, and you can follow me on all the social networks at elgin.com. And don't miss our other news show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. And that is the Tech News Today, ladies and gentlemen. This show was produced by Jason Cleanthes and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.